I want to say thank you to everything that they do uh, and help and support us. So thank you. Thanks. So without further ado, I would like to hand this over and welcome Commissioner Nicole Wilson. Thank you, thank you. so much. I, I am super grateful. I will tell you that I feel, um, because this reminds me of being on the dais or something, that I feel like I'm going to get my three minutes and that the mayor is going to take it back. So I, this is a little bit spoiling for me, but every time I come to Hunter's Creek, I feel spoiled. And it's because my residents, the association, the leadership, and the neighbors, I, I just feel at home here, and I can see why you call it home. Um, we always look forward to coming here, and I appreciate your time. I appreciate that if you... Um, um, have a friend or neighbor that's not here this evening and want to know more, please share our information, share that we've got this being recorded and we can um, connect with them outside of here. I will tell you that after my last year's engagements um, in bigger venues that I realized that the residents of Hunters Creek maybe needed a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. So we actually started doing office hours here and the association and leadership were kind enough to allow me some time here to actually have one-on-one -on -one meetings. So it's something that we're going to continue to do and I really want to um, invite anybody who has a concern about local issues or heck if you just want to talk to me about sports or something uh, make an appointment and we are certainly uh, friendly faces and always have your best interest um, I want to say a, a huge thank you to the Orange County team that's here this evening um, I feel very grateful for uh, all the leadership and an incredible work that goes into taking care of our residents and oftentimes a lot of it is behind the scenes, and as the person that you hired to come out and talk to you about stuff, I'm sort of in the front, and I, I sometimes feel like um, they are all the machinery that makes sure that Orange County is, is going in the right direction and doing the things that we are all so proud of. So I want to thank them for their time. I want to really quickly introduce my team who's all here. Also, I've got Angel and Drew and Cammie is, I think, maybe right outside the door. Small but mighty office, and we are here for you, so if you need any one of us, please grab us. I want to thank the Orange County Sheriff's Department, my wonderful partners there who, um, you know, the Orange County Sheriff is a constitutional officer, so they, they really do operate in their own capacity, but we have this incredible partnership, and we're able to take care of our residents in a very cohesive way. Orange County Fire and Rescue, of course, always makes me so proud. Um, and I have a couple housekeeping items, and you just reminded me of it. This weekend, there's a Hurricane Expo at West Orange High School. Um, lots of cool giveaways and interesting vendors for that, but ultimately, it's about safety. I know that going into the last hurricane season, I think people had that sense of, well, we haven't had one in a while. Yeah, so um, this go around, if you um, need to get your, you know, yourself caught up on the latest and greatest in how to protect your home or uh, making sure you know about the different services that are available, there's a Hurricane Expo this Saturday at West Orange High School. Um, I probably, at the end of this, will have a couple more closing thoughts, but that's the housekeeping I, I, that popped in my head as I looked over. Um, and then I think we will go into updates from our variety of um, departments here. So I don't know, is there a... Thank you so much, Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. Okay. All right, very good evening. My name is Humberto Castellaro, and it is a pleasure to be here with you this evening. So this is just an outline of the speakers today. I represent Public Works Department, and I will be talking to you regarding some of the improvements that we have. So we have the Utilities Department, the Planning Environmental Development Services Department, the PETS, the Orange County Fire Rescue Department with you, the Information System Services, Division 2050 and Orange Code, and of course we have the Orange County Sheriff Office and each one of them will be introducing themselves. When I think about public works, and sometimes we think about roads, we think about signals, we think about sidewalks, drainage, but more importantly, it is about the quality of life. Your quality of life, this is where you live, this is where you go to shop, for your schools, where you have built your memories and your families. So we are here about to enhance the quality of your life. Uh, we have three divisions that we are going to be talking about, the roads and drainage, that they take care of the roads, and of course the storm drains, the Stormwater Management Division, and then the Traffic Engineering Division. So for the roads and drainage, they do take care of the roadway rehabilitation. 
sometimes when we build roads, hopefully we're expecting that they will last a long time. However, we know that with time they deteriorate, so the, we have a 15-year cycle. What that means is that every 15 years, we will use one of the treatments that we have, where that is just replacing, called in place, or we have the mill and overlay, and the pothole repairs that they happen quite often. So we're giving it 15 years. We wish sometimes that it can be a shorter cycle, but it just depends on the budget. But that's where we are now. Of course, if you have any issue with the roadways, call 311. That your needs will be recorded, and then you can track your request. Too fast, I think. Let me just go back. Yeah. So this is an example of some of the roadways that we had been able to rehabilitate. As you see, this is fiscal year 1920. Uh, it is because it was needed, and remember that we go on the 15-year cycle. So you have the Cypress Crossing Drive and the Gator Line Drive. So you see the paper and you and the compactor. Uh, some of the things that it happens is it makes a little bit of noise, but we have to make sure that we have the proper compaction, that we use the right materials. So far, it had lately, because of the supply chain, it's been happening very difficult to get some of the materials and the aggregates, so the price has escalated a little bit. So we are taking care of those needs. In sidewalk repair, uh, it is critical for you to be able to walk, you know, for the kids to be able to go to your destinations. And sometimes, although a sidewalk it has been constructed recently, something happened that it needs to be replaced. Some of those things is that you may have some landscaping and the roots of the trees, and they just go ahead and uplift the sidewalk and then there is a, a difference in elevation and that becomes a tripping hazard or maybe it is because something happened that is a heavy equipment and it breaks down. So we do take care of our sidewalks uh, if it becomes a hazard. Those, and also we don't have sidewalks uh, to finish or to complete connectivity in some areas that we do not have it. Yeah. Also we have the curb repair as you can see on this picture and there is an existing yeah, <clears throat> curb line that we are upgrading. Part of that it is because yeah, <clears throat> maybe it had settled. You know, there's some difference in the elevation and then the water just remains in there and it doesn't flow to the drainage inlets. So part of our upkeep is just to make sure that the drainage properly runs to the catch basins as we have it. Yeah, and there's some additional sidewalk. So just, uh, those are all the streets since the fiscal year 1920 that we have uh, made improvements and then just with a total of a square feet close to over 100,000. And then the cost is not in there, but it's 1.2 million in terms of the cost that we have invested in your community. Yeah, <clears throat> part of the drainage also is just making sure that not only the runoff from the roadway goes into the system, but at the same time that it's able to traverse during the pipeline. Sometimes there is a lot of debris, it might be because of the sweeping, the foliage from the trees, so on and so forth. So we're very actively, you can see almost a dozen of the roadways in there. So we have uh, cleaned those pipes rather frequently and we have invested close to 120,000 and you see some of the workers. So uh, this is part of our regular maintenance. Then for the soil water management division, that will take care of the retention ponds so the main mm, objective is to provide the treatment and also the storage for the stormwater runoff. Some of these ponds, they might be wet detention ponds. Those are the ones that you see water year round. Or you have the dry retention ponds where the water will infiltrate as needed and uh, sometimes the water will stay in there for a little bit longer, but eventually it dries. Within the Hunters Creek and Stormwater community, we have 13 ponds that they are maintained by Orange County. Yeah. Part of our maintenance for the ponds is not only checking that all the drainage yeah, and the structures, they are intact, but also to do the, uh, the maintenance for the mowing and the inspections on a three to four week cycle. If there are any longer maintenance issues, fenced to repairs and whatnot, of course, uh, we do take care of those things as we come on a regular basis and we have addressed some of them also through the 311 calls. <coughs> For the traffic engineering division, our main responsibility 
is for the safety of your community. So we handle the corridors and the intersections analysis. What you can see in here, of course, um, our school is very active. So just trying to make sure that we have the proper signing and pavement markings. You see a crossing guard, the special emphasis crosswalks. We do have some uh, rectangular rapid flashing vehicles and also some traffic calming treatments like speed homes or speed cushions. Unfortunately, when you have a posted speed sign, you will think that everybody will obey <laughs> what it is being said, but uh, it doesn't happen like that all the time. So we have some yeah, improvements. Yeah. One of, of the things that we heard loud and clear from the community was about the town center boulevard, especially yeah, with the sad news about the, the fatality on the Malar intersection. And what can we do? Yeah, these roads, when they are built initially, we're expecting that everything will work well, perfect. But unfortunately, there is an evolution and growth through the transition. There's more cars, more people coming in, perhaps not familiar. So we are completing in this study, and the main emphasis was to take a look at the intersections and how they are operating for people coming in and out, some of the lighting. I know that we have made some improvements, but the goal is to make sure that we uh, suggest the proper treatments for the intersections. We know that we did remove some of the landscaping and we put some speed, speed feedback signs and did some additional pavement markings, but we want to take a look in a very holistic approach. Yeah. There are four intersections in here, and the intersections is something that we want to concentrate because that's where we have the highest number of conflicts, that we have people coming from all directions. You have pedestrians, you have cyclists, people making a left turn, right turn, and sometimes, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, they're looking for a gap, looking to the left, but they don't look to the right what is happening. So that's where some of the, um, the issues are so we can make sure that we address it properly. So this is uh, the Malar Cove our safety enhancements. So from the side streets, just putting some of these pavement symbols to tell them, please watch for pedestrians, that that is very critical. The special emphasis crosswalk, the warning signs also on the sidewalk for the pedestrians. Sometimes they're not looking down or they're looking at their cell phones, but just to make sure that whatever we can do to catch you know, all the modes of transportation attention and then the speed feedback sign, which it was working very well. Uh, I was driving at night and then I saw that uh, Sometimes I like to drive and test just to make sure that they're working <laughs> properly, so <laughs> it's very critical. Yeah. And then th these are some examples of some other things that we do for the traffic coming. So we can do in your residential areas, traffic circles. We have now the speed cushions. We have worked with the fire department that is not a flat surface <clears throat> all the way across from one end to the other end of the roadway, but you have these slots or indentations, and that is for the fire department to be able to have the front tires to go unimpeded so it doesn't delay them as much, and they have, say, 15 seconds, but in an emergency, you know, seconds or minutes can be the difference between life and death. Yeah. So thank you very much, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. I, I will tell you, I also sometimes do the stealth drive around, and I don't know if you all were here for the um, for our transportation meeting last year, where we really heard some of these concerns that are, we're now addressing. And uh, you may have seen on the news that we had some of those speed limits that were able to get down. And, and you know, I know there was no magic wand, and these things are happening one at a time. And I, the engagement has been so good from this community. Um, but we learned at that time about the pace car program, and that people could drive through going a certain you know speed limit, appropriate speed limit, even maybe a little under, and that you know peer pressure works. Peer pressure even works in traffic situations. And I tested it right here. I was like, I'm doing it. I'm going to be the pace car. I'll see if this works. And you do notice. And by the way, when somebody around tries to zoom around, you, it, it's very obvious that they're the jerk. And so I'm just saying, if you see a little uh, EV vehicle out there, it could be Commissioner Wilson doing the pace car thing. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, I was going to say, I'm introducing now, I think, Tim Armstrong um, from our utilities department for an update. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Tim Armstrong, Deputy Director for Orange County Utilities. I just wanted to tell you that it's a pleasure to serve your community, water, wastewater, reclaim water, and uh, recycling services and solid waste. I have David Gregory here with me. The manager of solid waste is going to speak as well. 
I'm going to cover some topics relative to the water, wastewater, and reclaimed water side. So we have one of the fastest growing utilities in Central Florida. Um, one of the things you'll see here, we've got uh, Marriott World Center. Marriott, on the whole, is one of our larger uh, commercial customers. They have so many locations, if you aggregated all of Marriott together, they'd be one of the largest. Um, without the aggregation, SeaWorld is one of our biggest customers on the commercial side. You also have the world-class Orange County Convention Center there. And up in the right-hand corner, we have our first graduating class of a H2O pipeline program that we put together. That is 10 university high school students that are learning to be wastewater operators. We have a, a challenge sometimes with some very technical positions that we have in utilities, and we're trying to um, train um, some folks so we can control the pipeline of of folks coming into us. But the population served about 800,000 water customers, over a million wastewater customers, almost 400,000 reclaimed water customers, and about 660,000 solid waste customers. And David will speak to that momentarily. So specifically to Hunters Creek, on the water side, we have just under 5,000 connections, 330 fire hydrants, almost 64 miles of water mains, and in 2022, we sent 687 million gallons of water to your community. And I'm glad, I get goosebumps when I think about that because when people turn on the water faucet, they expect a quality output. And sometimes it's taken for granted. And I can tell you what it takes to get that quality output to the, to the faucet sometimes is, is, is our full-time job. So you wanna make sure that the, the water coming out of the faucet is great and great quality. You wanna make sure when you flush the toilet, it goes where it's supposed to go. And when you have solid waste services, you wanna make sure those carts get picked up on a timely basis so you can get rid of your refuse. That is, a, is a, sometimes a challenge, but we, we relish it. On the wastewater side, about another 5,000 connections on wastewater, over 52 miles of gravity mains and force mains, eight pump stations, so there's 840 so uh, pump stations in Orange County across our 1,000 square mile service area, and you have eight here in Hunters Creek. 10 miles of reclaimed water mains, 151 reclaimed water connections, and we delivered almost 40 million gallons of reclaimed water uh, on top of the potable water uh, to, your, to your area. I'm gonna go into some pro uh, projects <laughs> good, that, have been, that are completed. We had an emergency um, repair, a thousand feet of, um, of, of line there right on John Young Parkway that we just finished not too long ago. About a million and a half dollars to replace that line. Uh, I know there was significant MOT and maintenance of traffic and some other things there, but we're happy to say that one's finished. We do have a pretty good system of maintenance. Um, we had 1,500 preventive maintenance calls uh, this last year to the Hunters Creek area, uh, and about 77 of those were evening and weekend work. So utilities is, uh, is pretty much 24-7. Line breaks and the such, they don't wait for, you know, um, just on Monday at, at 9 a.m. They happen whenever they happen, so we have to be up there. Uh, we did the preventive maintenance on the, on the fire hydrants, and we test blow-off valves, and we also move water around. We have to keep the water moving to maintain quality, so we have a very robust unidirectional flushing program that's on a five-year cycle. So we're making sure that the, the, and that's a unidirectional flush there uh, on the bottom right. We have a pump station that's been uh, under construction, what we would consider too long. <laughs> uh, and we sometimes you just have to fall on the sword, but we have a contractor that's been working on that for us. Uh, when I spoke on May 5th, I had to fall on the sword, so I'm gonna fall on the sword again tonight. Uh, when we met last year, we told you it, would have been, it was supposed to be done. Now I'm told that um, we're gonna have that done in August of this year, and we're, we're hoping that's the case. We're, we're, we're pushing that contractor very hard, but that was a $5.1 million complete rehab of that pump station, and uh, they had some staffing shortages, um, and, and we're, we're holding them uh, accountable into the fire, so I'm hoping that that August 2023 date happens and that gets completed. We're, we're, we're really hopeful that happens. Confident, actually. <laughs> The next one is our Hunters Creek. We're doing some rehab at our Hunters Creek water supply facility, which I understand is maybe as with the crow flies right, right over here. We're doing a complete electrical upgrades. We're upgrading pumps, valves, a generator, fuel tank. We're upgrading 12 inch lines to 16 inch lines. We're building equipment enclosures and that's supposed to start summer and that's a $5.6 million project 
Um, yeah, when you see these dollars, they're expensive. We have seen, just like every other department that's going to talk tonight, um, very significant increases in cost. Uh, but, but we're game. I mean, we're, we're here to make sure that everything's working right. And on the next one, I'm going to talk a little bit about an, an issue we had um, with a flushing campaign. You can see here, this is what's referred to as Lot 14. We had done a, 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 some maintenance of a flushing program, and we had, um, instead of putting the, the line over here, we had flushed in this direction. And typically that water flows down to Plant Drive and then down in a manhole. But some water had gotten onto this site. And quickly we were notified of it and we shifted our operations to make sure that it came over here and went down one of these locations. And our standard operating procedure now is to do this. We're not even going to make sure lot, that that lot 14 is not impacted by any, any uh, maintenance of water flushing that we're doing. We do apologize for that and we appreciate your patience. You guys have always been very, very good to us. So we want to maintain that relationship. A little humble brag here, um, we have one of the largest floating solars um, in the state of Florida and I, I believe that's going to probably be eclipsed by a Duke Energy installation here in the coming weeks or months, but this is a 1.2 megawatt, we, we call photovoltaic, we, we call it flotovoltaic because it's floating, but it's, it's, it's kind of key, it's interesting because a lot of uh, solar installations are ground mounted and that takes up a lot of valuable real estate. There's a lot of maintenance that's required because you have to mow underneath those arrays. And, and the other thing is um, you can actually get a benefit of the cooling effect of the water and you get more efficiency out of the solar panels. These just happen to be bifacial. So the sun can come down and hit the water and hit the underside of some of these and you can get a significant improvement there. Um, Commissioner Wilson was out there when we pushed this last one right here. This was one of the last ones we pushed out. And we're getting ready to connect that in August. And what we're doing is we're using these uh, floating solar arrays to offset our electrical consumption on site. So we're going to offset about $140,000 of annual power savings a year. And that's a 30-year installation. So we're going to save a bunch of money on power. And we're doing that all over the county. I think we have five or six megawatt in production that's getting ready to go through. Two in construction and another four behind them. And lastly, you may have seen it. We're involved, we're a key contributor in the SORAP, it's Sustainable Operations Resilience Action Plan that has been put forward by Orange County. We're doing our part to make sure we have EV charging stations. You may have seen the, the new uh, Ford Lightning out there that we, ha we brought tonight, that we just took ownership of that vehicle. It's got about 1,000 miles, uh, miles on it, but <coughs> we drove it over here from Curry Ford. We want to be part of the solution. And where it makes sense, we're buying EV vehicles as we replace aging infrastructure in our utility. And with that, I'll turn it over to David, who will talk trash. <laughs> okay, so, um, I, and I, I have got to say, as somebody who's worked in environmental law, that the, the clean water when you turn on your faucet issue is not glamorous when it's happening the right way. But, you know, you don't have to be an environmental expert to know about cases across this country where local governments took shortcuts, made poor decisions, and, and, and next thing you know, there's a whole generation of young people impacted by those outcomes. So it is something that I don't take for granted, and I try to make sure that we really hold up how incredible the quality is. And, you know, it, it's an unbelievable operation. I also want to say that the next time, put the picture of me in the slot. Yeah, we have it. <laughs> so going out there, that, that solar array, it's actually, it's difficult to tell by that photo, but it's like a bunch of rafts. So it actually moves with the water because I think talking to residents and showing them that, they said, well, what happens in a storm? Does it blow away? And actually they can tighten it down like you would a raft or allow it to some motion. And so, you know, knowing that they're more efficient because they're getting the cooling effect, that they're literally cooling the water underneath there so you have actually a, a cleaner, less gunky retention pond and that we're running a utility from something so, you know, right there on site. Anyway, it's, I'm, it's a huge bragging point for me too. So thank you for yeah, sharing that. We appreciate your support. As always. Yeah, I, I think I have the opportunity to speak about something that's even less glamorous than water and wastewater. And, and I'm David Gregory. Again, I'm the Solid Waste Division Manager for Orange County. So talk a little bit about our um, waste and recycling collection program here in Orange County. We provide service to about 230,000 residential units in the unincorporated part of the county. Each of the cities has their own programs for collection, but so we focus on those areas that are unincorporated. 
Hunter's Creek is in our zone three. We have five collection zones. It's zone three, and you're, as, as you may know, your service provider is Waste Management, Inc. Um, of course, we provide once a week collection of garbage in carts, recycling in carts, uh, up to three cubic yards of yard waste if it's put in bags, bundles, or uh, in cans. Uh, here in, in Hunter's Creek, uh, specifically, we provide service to about 4,750 4, households. Um, so four services a week, that's almost a million services in a, in a year, about, again, 988,000. Um, last couple of times I've spoken to, to this group, have, I've had to you know, make apologies for how this uh, poor service had been going on. And as you can see, this shows the number of complaints we had gotten in Hunter's Creek over a period of time since, um, since uh, for the last two years or so. And while we had seen some improvement, boy, it really didn't help when we had a couple of hurricanes. And that really did, did um, set back the service levels. But as you can see, you know, since that time, we think we've been on a, a positive tra trajectory. And we, we do uh, make a lot of effort to keep in, in, uh, in contact with the haulers, follow up on complaints we receive from residents. Um, so again, you know, 248 complaints in 2022, including all of those uh, hurricane opportunities. We're really hoping if we got a nice smooth season, we'll, we'll see fewer complaints this year. One of the things I did want to talk to you about a little bit is what we call household hazardous waste. Um, there are things in your house that if a business or industry went to throw them away, they would be regulated as hazardous waste and they would have to go on a hazardous waste manifest and, the, and, the, and, and be tracked cradle to grave. And the reason that they, they, they have to be managed like that is because it can be very dangerous and very injurious to workers. They can impact the environment. And um, so we have a household hazardous waste collection program that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. So the idea is what we want you to do is not throw those in your garbage. Um, and one of, the, one of the more interesting and, um, gosh, trends in, in hazardous waste problems we're seeing is anything with a, recycle, with a rechargeable battery in it. So if you've got something with a rechargeable battery, don't throw it in your garbage. I'm sure, I'm sure Chief could speak to the number of fires that get caused by these lithium batteries. It's very highly reactive. There's a reason why they work so good and they power your phone because there's a lot of energy in there. But when it gets impacted, it, it releases that energy in a bad way and we've seen a lot of fires. We actually have, that's Seminole County. You can see three of their transfer uh, trailers burned up because there were batteries in there. We have fires from time to time at the landfill that we really can't put our finger on but many of the times it's associated with the lithium batteries. And, and, you know, and, and even our own household hazardous waste center caught fire and burned up because of the lithium ion battery. So again, we have a program to accept those from, from you. Um, and so please don't put them in the regular garbage. We have, kind of a distance. yeah. Take a take a look at. Um, I think it's. Uh, 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 if we get together afterwards, and I can refer you to the website. Places like Home Depot will accept some batteries for drop off. That's why no longer does. Yeah, and some of those, but probably because of that yeah, fire hazard. Mm -hmm. But we have we have permanent locations at the Porter Transfer Station, which is closer to here. Again, not right next door. And we also have one at the landfill, and that is a little bit of a, a ways away. But we do have, once a year, we have our community collection events, and that's what I wanted to mention is we did have one at Freedom High School, and we'll, 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 we, we suspended those during the, um, during the COVID period, and so we're getting back on track to having those once a year. Uh, we, we have four remote locations. We have the permanent facilities that are open six days a week and available to the public, and then we have once once uh, four times a year, we'll have in four different areas of the county uh, what we call a, 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 a temporary collection event. And so again, here, the one we had most recently in February, and we'll be back out in this area again that same time of year around February, 
um, keep your eyes peeled, but 753 folks did deliver material to us. And as you can see, the, the, the amount of material we hauled out of, out of there, 12,000 pounds of household chemicals, you know, 10,000 pounds of electronics, um, two and a half cubic yards of fluorescent bulbs. And as I mentioned, we do have the permanent sites at the um, Orange County Landfill and the Porter Transfer <clears throat> Station. Another good, um, <clears throat> a good source of information would be to go to our, our Orange County website and look under recycling. And we have a what's goes where app in there and you can enter batteries and it may provide you some more information about local places that would accept the batteries. But again, if we could get together after this, I'll give you some ideas. Um, and I never, I, I always like when I speak to folks, I never give up uh, uh, the chance to talk about what goes in your recycle bin <laughs> because we see a whole lot of stuff that goes in recycle bins that doesn't belong in recycle bins. Um, and there's five things, you know, plastic, jugs, tubs, and bottles. If it's not a plastic, jug, tub, or bottle, don't put plastic in your recycle bin. Uh, metal cans, you know, metal cans, of course, aluminum cans, uh, green bean cans, glass containers, jars and bottles, and then cardboard, paper. Anything else belongs in your regular garbage can. So again, we, we work on our, you know, think five, focus on those, those five items, and you're certain to put the right things in your recycle bin. And to get that word out about what goes in the recycle bin and what doesn't go in the recycle bin, we have partnered with, um, you know, uh, uh, other, the, the surrounding county, Seminole County, Osceola County, the cities here in, in Orange County, to have centralfloridarecycles.org. It's one, one place where people can go to find out information about recycling because each, each, each city and the county has its own little spin on it, but we all recycle the same things, and we want to make sure, even if all of our, our programs aren't exactly alike, they're all in alignment, and they're all... Uh, similar to each other. So recently we had a, um, <clears throat> a billboard campaign. Again, the problem is trying to keep those things out of the recycle bin that can interfere with the recycling process. And um, I thought we should have made, the, um, made these little monsters look like some of the people that we work with, but we, we weren't <laughs> able to do that. Um, and then part of our, our, our awareness and, and uh, the cart tagging we've, we've done, we, we continue to, to try to provide curbside information using the, um, the, the OOPS tags to people. Um, we were recently recognized by the Solid Waste Association of North America, which again, not a whole lot of people know about, but here in this industry, it, it, is, it, is, it is pretty um, important. And again, that's being recognized by our peers in the industry of having one of the top uh, communication, education, and marketing programs. And so we're very proud of, um, of our activities trying to educate the public on how to recycle right. And next up is Alan, and I'll turn it over to Mr. So Marshall. I think, I don't know if it was you that taught me the when in doubt, throw it out. When in doubt, throw it out. Yeah. And that's another one that, you know, I think it's a good educational piece. I think we all do the wish cycling because you really wish they could recycle this item. But, you know, it turns out that would contaminate a whole load of recyclables. And so, you know, I, I, I think we've gotten better and better about including things. But if it's not on that list, boy, go ahead and, and put it in the other side. Exactly. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Commissioner. Oh, that that oh. is the hardest thing to do, to, to no. throw something out. I'm an environmental guy, spent my life doing environmental work, and for me, I think every single thing I put in that trash, I'm thinking I about know. it. And, and to know that it's like, oh, I wish I, I could do stuff. That wish cycling is, is a strong urge. It is, and I, and I you know, I... <laughs> David Gregory and I have lots of conversations about how we can, you know, maybe work composting in in the future, and we've got to figure it out. We got to close that loop. You know, yep. I mean, it's just not enough room in the ground for all of our junk. But, um, but I I love how conscientious I think our residents are, and so a lot of times we we I hear from people that actually get those tags, and and they will say, I did not know until I got my tag, and these are people that are you know that sort of follow the rules and that are engaged, and and so I think you know education in different from different angles is always so helpful. And then, you know, anytime that you can add it to your own newsletter at your school or, or your workplace, please, you can rip off our stuff <laughs> and share it because that's the way we get everybody on board. Right. Um, and, and all of these challenges really aren't unique to Orange right. County. I, I, I have a wife who runs solid waste in a small, in a small city nearby. And every day I, I hear the same things. It's, it's, it's always a challenge, um, but they're, everybody's working hard, you know, to try to, to do their best. So uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Alan Marshall. I am assistant to the director of the Planning, Environmental, and Development Services Department. I have the longest title <laughs> in, the, in the county. I don't know. 
<laughs> been, been, well, so our, our director uh, was John Weiss. He's now the deputy county administrator. That's why you have uh, me here. If anybody's looking to run growth and development in the county, we can talk afterwards. That <laughs> position is open. So uh, today I just want to introduce you to the, uh, to the divisions that are in the PES department. You have the, obviously the building safety division, our environmental protection division, fiscal and operational support, which is a lot of the back of the house work that goes uh, into growth and development in the county, housing and community development, neighborhood services, which used to be code enforcement and neighborhood services, those two emerged together. Uh, the planning division, the transportation planning division, and also the county's zoning division. And, and collectively, those, those groups, if you watched the, uh, the mayor give his state of the county, uh, we, did, we processed $3.4 billion worth of development valuation in this county uh, this last year. Just a staggering amount uh, of growth. Um, but that's, uh, that's good development and, and it floats all the boats. As you see, our mission there is our department is committed to providing the highest level of services to build and foster healthy and sustainable communities. And uh, Tim mentioned our SORAP, the county has a very vigorous uh, sustainability uh, program and that, that, that is in essence salt that gets added to everything that we do uh, in the county uh, to, to improve it. Let's see if I can get this to go forward. So I'm just going to touch a couple aspects of a couple of those divisions, building safety, environmental protection neighborhood services, and uh, since Parks isn't here, I have a slide uh, or two there uh, for on, on their behalf. So um, <clears throat> County Building Division, uh, just in uh, Hunters Creek, we did about 1,350 permits last year. Uh, probably not a surprise that a lot of those had to do with hurricane you know, damage. Actually, I just got my roof finished you know, from, uh, from hurricane damage just in the last few weeks. But 415 roof repairs, 113 additions and repairs, probably some of those are, could be hurricane related like pool enclosures, things like that. Uh, had some new pools and 14 uh, new construction. For commercial, you had eight new construction, 23 alterations and repairs. And then you see that 2,000 or so inspections. And that's, you know, usually you're gonna have one or two, maybe three inspections, depending on the level uh, of, uh, <coughs> of the project. We have to be and are about the service because the county we have the regulations and it's our responsibility to help people through it whether you're a, you know a single person in your house to the biggest company in orange county we've got to be there and ready to help <coughs> you through that process and the county as i said for residents and businesses we have online permitting so and, and really COVID was what accelerated that we were it was one of the things we were looking to do and trying to do it but you know everybody got uh, put online essentially um during that time but that can be difficult, especially for residents. And so we do have those by appointment care, you know, sessions, and we will walk you through that entire process if it's, if it's needed. But for businesses, we have about a 10 person online help desk team. So they're, they're, they are working all day long, working with developers to make sure that when they are uploading applications, uploading data, that it's in the right format. And so all of that helps make the process go faster. Just less mistakes at the beginning is less mistakes or less time, you know, that you, or more time that you save through the process. We do <coughs> outreach forums. The mayor, uh, when he took office, uh, turned to our planning and growth management and said, I want you to do a top-down review of your processes. I want to make sure that we've got the best process, you know, in, in our region. And the Customer First Development Services Initiative was just that, a review of all of our service delivery and everything that goes behind it. Uh, from staff to the culture, because it's really the culture that sets the success, you know, within the organization. And Team 400 there is uh, really the, the outgrowth of that. We have about 400 staff in the county across 17 different divisions, and this is sort of the tagline, um, that, that work collaboratively to help our customers build their dreams, okay? And so that Team 400, uh, we're styling and building uh, training programs, and it's from onboarding day one through existing staff through the management teams. Tim, you've, you've gone to those classes. You know, we've, you know all, of our, all of our leadership is going through uh, this, this culture uh, and training program, all to provide that, uh, the best service that we can, because that's a continual thing. You, if you ever stop trying to improve, you, 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 know, you need to go, probably. <clears throat> then um, pivoting to environmental protection, um, obviously they're committed to all environmental protection in the county, but here we're just talking about uh, surface water. So you see MPDES inspection of HOA stormwater ponds. MPDES, just think stormwater, okay? 
So we respond to complaints about illicit discharges into ponds, and a lot of times those are things that can be handled with education. Most times people think it's a big body of water, I can just kind of chuck whatever this is in there and it'll be diluted and it's fine, or I can put this down the drain um, on the road and it'll be fine because, I mean, we get a lot of rain here in Florida. But that's not necessarily the truth. And so education really is the key uh, to those issues and we try you know, at our, our best to handle most things through education. We also work with your Hunters Creek Teen Advisory and Service uh, Committee uh, with their, uh, you see their, the youngsters doing the storm drain labeling. We've, they've delivered, uh, I think, 46 uh, storm drain inlets. And I think they have another uh, project this year that is planned. So uh, we always enjoy working, not just with the residents, but with the youth in our, in our community because they're gonna learn at a rapid rate uh, just by doing. So Shingle Creek uh, it goes, you know, south uh, through Orange County and then ultimately down to the Everglades. But you've got, we've got some uh, nutrient reduction projects. You may have heard these if you came last year, just giving you somewhat of a, um, an update here. So that Pond 6010, the one at the top there by Conroy Road, the issue there, the modification that's happening to that pond, a pond is there to treat water, okay? And usually it's about residence time, how long it sits in there, nutrients get, get you know, taken up by vegetation and other things. But here we had a situation where the, in, the inlet and the outlet were too close to each other and you could, circuit, you could circumvent the whole treatment ability of that pond. And so what we're doing is moving them you know, to provide that residency time for the water that flows in to be treated before it flows out. The second one down there, 6459, uh, down there along uh, Americana, that's a situation where what we're doing is actually trying to increase the residency time in, in that pond. Okay, you can kind of create like an S, you know, and so it has a longer flow through. And then it has, uh, we're putting in a media filtration just as a, as a polishing step. And those can be all different uh, kinds of uh, uh, treatment, but it's you know, like the last little cleaner before it goes out. So those are two projects that are going on and you see the bid so, uh, solicitations are, are happening this year. That uh, we have uh, real time uh, and, and staff uh, sampling from you know, the Cinco Creek pretty much starts just south of the of the B line, I mean, of the uh, East West, there, kind of by Rick and Lee's Oyster House, it kind of starts right up there. And uh, McKinley Ave, we have a, uh, a real time monitoring station, so it's a staff person who works all day long without complaining because it's a machine. And uh, the rest of them, as you see in, in that list, going all the way down to Highway 192, those are sampling stations where our staff go out and they're measuring for turbidity and for fecal coliform and nutrients and metals, heavy metals, things like that. And you can see all of that data and look around at the rest of the county on that Orange County uh, or orangewateratlas.usf.edu. If you've, if you've got some time on a Saturday and you've not checked that website out, go and do it because you'll find yourself diving into all the different lakes around and seeing how clean are they, okay? What challenges do they have? What, what rivers you know, or, or streams are, are potentially polluted? So it's, it's a, it, it's an, I'm an ecologist, so I kind of dig that stuff, but uh, take, a, take a look at it. You'll be surprised. You'll, you'll spend some time on that site. Big issue in Orange County is fertilizer. It's a big issue everywhere. Um, we have a fertilizer ordinance. I was fortunate enough to write the first one a long, long time ago in the county. We've uh, done some modifications to it um, that have kind of evolved as the state of Florida has evolved with the use of fertilizer. They're just uh, making sure that when you're fertilizing, you're fertilizing the right amount and not at the wrong time. The wrong times obviously are when it's about to really rain. And the, you wanna make sure that you're using uh, slow release fertilizers, so that you're just metering it out uh, instead of just a big flush that runs, it runs down past the roots. As soon as it gets past the roots, it's, it's gone. It's into, the, it's into the water column. So we have blackout seasons through the summer, uh, and that is something that has taken about 10 years to become more in vogue in Florida. Um, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not hard to, to read the news and look at uh, the, just the horrific water quality that's going on around the state to realize that this is it, guys. You know, this is, it's fertilizer uh, in large part. So um, the county's uh, lo looking at specifically Shingle Creek. That's the purple shaded area there in the picture. Uh, we recently, our Environmental Protection Division gave a fairly substantial presentation to our board um, talking about that specific basin. There is, you know, there is still undeveloped area in, in that basin. We wanna make sure that as we move forward and as we consider development, 
um, that we are, that we have uh, you know very very an, an acute focus on that area. So we talked about um, how we are planning and developing potentially in the future, and you'll hear a little bit about Vision 2050 in soon. But whether or not we need special basin criteria for that basin, whether we need to increase buffers when you build to wetlands or land preservation efforts. So all of that is ahead of us, but it's, it's, a, it's a sharp focus that we're putting on that specific area in the county. The county has uh, always been investing uh, in its environmental sense of lands. The mayor came in and uh, really put that uh, on a faster track. You put uh, the, and the board approved $100 million for environmental sense of land acquisition. Uh, we want to double that by 2030. That's a bold uh, goal. As you can see, we've got about 23,400 acres. And that's one of the things that we're really looking at that Shingle Creek Basin is can we can we make some gains there because we'd rather preserve um, a lot of that area, especially if it's, you know, very valuable wetland, which leads into the wetland ordinance revisions. This is a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. I'm a, I'm a wetland scientist and I've been where I work at the state and I've you know, worked on our county wetland ordinance uh, over the last 20 years. And it's a great big deal that we are revising that ordinance now to make it not just more protective, but protecting the right things okay sometimes you fight over small things but that's what's going on right now we have a consultant who's, who's helping us do that study and we've given the board two or three presentations now um, moving forward now to uh, to coming up with for new code for uh, that specific issue of wetlands but the Shinko Creek area is is a critical one uh, in that regard neighborhood services last one on on the list here uh, that uh, used to be code enforcement and neighborhood services we merged them together because frankly they're they're in the same place they're doing the same thing they engage and strengthen neighborhoods by encouraging compliance with relevant codes along with outreach and assistance for uh, neighborhood planning and community development and so this year we also looked at our consumer protection uh, groups two or three folks who were out there who help uh, our county with complaints about fraud or deceptive practices things like that. And so we brought them under that neighborhood services umbrella, really trying to consolidate those services so that we can be more effective when we're out in the communities. Our, our neighborhood services, they, uh, issue, they have neighborhood beautification grants. There's a couple of different kinds of grants there, um, up to ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to help uh, neighborhoods improve. They have a big community conference every year where HOAs all get together. I know that you've been there. Uh, Citizen Planner Academy and Community Connections are really about making our, our uh, you know, kind of our best citizens who are really wanting to get involved, teaching them how to how to work with us, you know, most effectively and in their communities. So those are great, uh, great programs. You have uh, your own uh, new uh, code enforcement um, officer. You see there, Jamal Jackson um, and his contact information. Um, so these these staff uh, code enforcement and you see there the, it's always kind of fun when we do this every year and we talk about this one statistic. So countywide code enforcement incidents about 14,000 for 2022. Hunters Creek had 53, and uh, that's like 0. .006. So <laughs> you're not the problem <laughs> in the county. So feel good about that. Feel good about that. You have about 17 open cases. Very, very, very high compliance rate. So when, when something steps out of bounds, it comes back in quickly. So that's a good, that's a good thing. And so we wanted to provide you, we have a new staff person who's, uh, who's working with your organization. And just for anybody in general, and you've heard this before, um, if whether it's a code violation or anything else that you need from the county, 311 is your, that, that is your portal, you know, to the county. And I have tested it out because you always say it. And I was like, I'll, I'll occasionally call up and I'll, I'll see, can I get, can they, I know the county, I've been here 29 years, almost 30. And so I want to see, do they get me to the right person? And they do. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable um, group of people. 311, that's, that, that's your way to, to get into the county and, and get the best thing. So I have a slide here on Deputy Brandon Coates uh, Community Park. Um, I guess they have some dust issues out there with the roadway. Oh, and I can explain. They know this. Oh, they know all this? Okay. I was going to say, and then I, the other, so. yeah, there's, there's so much that this Oops. community does know that it, it, there was um, the original surface was a, because it, it was part of the um, right. Duke property. Yes, they're putting a new surface yes. on there. Yes, so there's a new surface, but it was a kind of a long slog because we had to work with the power company to try to get the right approvals for it. But it was I a lot of problems. Happening real soon, it's so, happening. Yeah. It's happening. Oh, there's lots of dump trucks coming It's happening. Yes, <laughs> 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 the sun is going to be good. <laughs> it's the tough part of the project, probably, when, exactly. when it doesn't exactly. happen. So, uh, uh, Michael Valla, um, Deputy Fire Chief, uh, up next. Yay, and thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I was going to um, brag about my Hunter's Creek 
uh, residents and the association and leadership here because um, having the updates from PEDS is, is so critical, but they have been just lockstep with us all along the way on the Shingle Creek protections, on our wetland code protections, on stormwater treatment, because it's so critical to this area. Um, if you look at the largest residential community closest to Shingle Creek, it's, it's you all. So, um, you know, the motivation here to continue those efforts just has been is such an inspiration for me and then I get to go back to them and they've been so good about really working towards those goals. So uh, thank you, Alan. And Chief, you're up. <laughs> All right, I'm uh, Mike Fight. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations for Orange County Fire Rescue. It's great to be here tonight. Um, when, I, when I start thinking about this presentation every year, I realize that not only do we serve Hunters Creek, but at Fire Rescue, we're residents of Hunters Creek. So our station 58 is embedded in the community and our firefighters live there 24 seven. So. Um, everything that impacts you in this community also impacts us, so we're all in it together. Um, I do have some fire department trivia in here a little bit later on, and that is what is the busiest hour of the day for fire rescue and the busiest day of the week. So give that a little bit of thought. Um, over at uh, fire rescue, we have 44 fire stations, soon to be 45. Uh, we have a fire station up in the Horizons West area that is just about a month away from uh, opening. We respond to uh, over 140,000 calls every year throughout Orange County, and uh, we treat and transport over 78,000 patients and, and take them to the hospital. And we do that um, with 1,553 dedicated men and women. Um, your fire station, Station 58, which I'm sure many of you see uh, as you move throughout the community, uh, has three uh, highly specialized pieces of equipment. One is Engine 58, that's the big fire truck that you see. Um, that has a paramedic on it and four firefighters. Uh, sometimes uh, we get a question, hey, I cut my finger uh, making dinner. Why'd you send this gigantic fire truck? It has a paramedic, and um, when you're having an emergency, you really don't care what they arrive on as long as they get there quickly. So that's why you see a fire truck go to medical calls. Um, we also have a rescue that has a paramedic on it as well. And then, uh, particularly this community, we have Brush 58. And uh, that is a special off-road vehicle that's specifically designed to be small enough to fit between your houses and get between you and a wildfire so that we can protect your property. Um, and as I'm sure you all have known on some of our drier years, that has been a very busy unit for you. Um, we're a full service fire department. I won't talk about everything here, but basically it means uh, if it's not a law enforcement issue, we're your guys. And uh, that's everything from fire suppression, emergency medical treatment, um, I'm very proud of our technical rescue team. If you saw on New Year's Eve, uh, the Orlando I stopped turning, uh, and there were some br very brave men and women that scaled that 400-foot structure and made rescues. That's technical rescue. That's what they do. Um, and our first first responders, our dispatchers, um, if you want to see amazing rescue work, step into a dispatch center. Uh, they do incredible work. Um, we also have a fantastic emergency management uh, division. They're very active during our hurricane season and it takes a tremendous amount um, to feed and operate this department. That's where logistics come in, comes in. Building fire stations, designing fire trucks, and fueling um, our operation. Um, you have a very high performing fire station, Station 58. So I talked about our dispatchers. They have 60 seconds to find out where you are, what your problem is, and what's the best unit to send. Out of uh, Station 58's area, they do that in 36 seconds, uh, which is incredible. And then our firefighters have 60 seconds for the time that tone goes off to get the truck moving down the road. And out of Station 58, they do that in 43 seconds. Um, when I visit them there, I do not stand between them and the fire truck because they will knock you over getting <laughs> out the door. Um, and then when you look at the entire area covered by Station 58, on average, their travel time is uh, just over seven minutes, which is uh, outstanding fire rescue coverage. Um, <laughs> it's probably not a surprise, but every year we get a little bit busier. So uh, when you look uh, in 2020, we were running just over 3,700 calls out of Station 58. Um, and last year we did uh, 4,600. So it uh, keeps getting a little bit busier as more and more people come in and more and more cars are on the road. Um, a month in the life. So this is what a daily uh, or, or a monthly um, outlook looks like out of Station 58. They run almost 500 calls out of that fire station in a month. <clears throat> and that includes <clears throat> 65 auto accidents, 14 structure fires. Might surprise you that your fire department, the, the least thing they do is structure fires. Um, 82 general fire service incidents, really anything you need help with. 
Uh, one wildland fire, which that's a very good year for us here in Hunters Creek. And then the real story is 310 of those calls are for emergency medical service. That's what fire rescue does. And of those, we took about 147 people to the hospital in one month. And this happens every month, year round. Um, I mentioned the busiest day of the week. It's Friday. Probably nobody is surprised by that. We get extremely busy on Friday. And um, our busiest time is 6 o'clock. So tomorrow at 6 o'clock, uh, Fire Rescue will be out and making it happen. Uh, if you want an uneventful drive to work, leave at 2 a.m. on Tuesday. And um, you will probably not see much happening. Um, this, this is very important. So I talk a lot about Station 58 because that's really your crew. Those are your men and women that protect you. Um, but in fire rescue, it's not a, just about a single fire station. It's really an overlapping network of protection. So clearly, um, if somebody's having an emergency and then you have your emergency right behind them, you hope somebody's there to back them up, right? Well, in uh, Hunter's Creek, you are uh, very well covered. So you see Station 58. Uh, in the center, and they are surrounded by five other fire stations. So really, there, there's kind of this health healing network where when 58 gets busy, we have other units that we can move in that are readily available. Um, or if the emergency is big enough that it'll take multiple firefighters, you have a lot of fire stations to draw upon. So um, if you were going to design premier fire protection, this is what it looks like. And um, one last thing to mention, for anybody who lives along the, the Vistas area, you'll remember that there is a fire break that our partners over at the uh, Florida Forest Service created. Um, when I was gearing up for the presentation uh, last month, I got in contact with my counterpart in the Forest Service. Uh, they are widening that fire break, so they have uh, set aside a budget to do that this year. Um, so you're going to see that uh, space essentially double. and. Um, in talking with, with my partners over there, they have credited the work done in that fire break for stopping multiple fires that have been in that area. So that is great news uh, to hear that they're going to uh, be out there. And with that, I will turn it over to Brandy Davis. Thank you so much, Chief. Good afternoon. I'm Brandy Davis representing ISS and Orange County 311. So the Hunters Creek community is uh, pretty familiar <laughs> with 311 and our services. Uh, but if you're not, we take calls for a couple of different departments within Orange County. Anything ranging from animal issues, whether it's a nuisance animals, um, or if it's an animal that's sick or possibly injured, things you may see in your community, such as your neighbor may not be cutting their grass, you know, operating some type of illegal business, junk, vehicles everywhere parked on the side of the road. Um, we also handle things that you see while you're driving in your community, uh, which uh, was alluded to before, such as traffic light issues, timing issues, sidewalks that may be cracked or uneven. You may see potholes in the road, things of that nature. And then we also have some unique services, such as if you would like a smoke detector installed inside of your home, you can contact the room one and we can take a service request and get you over uh, to fire rescue, as well as mosquito control, which is pretty popular in the summertime. We also take those calls as well. Um, but there's, we also take calls if you have no idea who to contact in the county to get something done, you can call us and we can help you. We can put you on the right path to that department and individual and make sure that you get connected to whomever you're trying to reach. Um, aside from that, we have several ways of contacting 311. You can call us by phone. Uh, we also have a mobile app that you can utilize. We have an online request form that you can submit inquiries to. Um, you can also chat with a live representative if you choose to. And if you still use a fax machine, you can actually send us fax. And we will process them through our fax machine as well. So 311 is composed of 27 employees. And so last year, 311 took over 200,000 calls uh, within Orange County. And although we have all of our means of communication, our most popular means of contacting 311 is actually through the phone. Wow. Uh, over 90% of our calls originate from phone calls, even though we have all the other avenues uh, for citizens. So we are in hurricane season, started June 1st. 
And so as you can imagine, we also take on a different role. In the event of a natural disaster, such as a hurricane or even a tropical storm, depending on what's declared um, by our mayor, we take on the role and responsibility of a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week emergency call center. So during that time period, we open up to Orange County residents so they can contact us about uh, sandbags, report uh, instances of flooding, anything that may go on in a storm that you have questions for, we're open before, during, and afterwards uh, for your needs. So I'm pretty sure you guys contacted us last year about storm debris. Yeah. <laughs> so we also handled the storm debris calls as well. Um, so aside from that, one fun fact that I like to share with you, it's not really a fun fact, but our number one, uh, out of all the departments we take calls for, our number one customer is animal services. By far, most of our calls that we receive are by animal services, asking about adoptions. Um, lots of people, they love their animals. They're either asking about adoptions, they're reporting their neighbor's animals. Uh, even on our smartphone app, they have this great feature where you can take pictures of things that you see in your community and send them us, and you won't believe how many amounts of dog feces we get oh reported <laughs> through our app as they're reporting their neighbors. Um, I think our, our craziest call that we received, one of many, because we get a lot, is that we had a citizen contact us and ask us, they said they're at an ATM machine, the ATM machine gave them way too much money, they're like, what do we do? <laughs> but we get a lot of different calls from different residents. Oh, we love what we do, so please continue to contact us. We have some great hours. We're open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, and then we're also open on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we, Tim did the math over here. We, we were looking at this, uh, realizing with a team of 27 that that's 31, call, average 31 calls per day per rep. But that, that means on the weekends, yeah, I mean, it's nonstop, right? Like yes. that is, that's incredible. I want to put a plug in. I appreciate the work so much. And it really helps us also because that's data. And so when we're looking from a policy perspective about what needs to be addressed, we can see what these calls are addressing, what is really on, you know, on the minds of our residents in sort of a way that we are able to distill it for policy. So thank you so much for your work. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Olin Hill and I'm the assistant manager in the Orange County Planning Division. Um, and, and funny, funny fact, I actually called the nine, um, 311 a few weeks ago when I ran into a dead end on a work issue and Brandy was able to help me navigate that and, and help a customer. So she's awesome. Super. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope you've learned a lot tonight because I've learned a lot tonight just from hearing everyone on the panel. Um, I'm here to talk to you about um, um, the planning division in Orange County's um, two major initiatives right now regarding growth management. And that includes um, Vision 2050 and Orange Code. Um, Vision 2050 is our long range comprehensive plan. And Orange Code is the, um, is the mechanism that implements the vision. Um, together, Vision, vision 2050 and um, Orange Code are being reinvented and redesigned to help initiate a place-based place -based, uh, approach to, to, um, to growth and development in Orange County. Our codes today and our, and our comp plan are very dated, as you'll see in just a second. And our efforts right now are to bring those up to, to today's standards and to recognize um, how we're evolving as a community, especially during that planning horizon of 2050. Again, um, the comprehensive plan that we have today, I consider this as our land use Bible. It kind of guides how we want to, um, to grow and to develop. Um, and it, it provides a lot of guidance for not only the planning division, but other divisions and other departments across the county as we look towards that, that planning horizon of, in this case, 2050. Our comp plan was adopted in 1991. Um, it's been updated since then, but it's still very outdated in, in terms of the development pattern that it, 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 it ushers in. We've changed a lot in, in, since 1991, and so we're, our, our efforts now are to bring that up to today's standards. Um, our, our zoning code is actually older than our comprehensive plan because zoning goes back further than the, the state's growth management plan requirements. Our, our orange code document is replacing a code that is 66 years old. Um, it was adopted in 1957. And again, it's been amended and, and, and tweaked and, and you know, little fixes here and there over the, over the past 60 years, but it's still very outdated. You can still see passages that were clearly written in the 50s. 
So Vision 2050, I like this diagram because it basically kind of tells you what it does. These are images of, of places in Orange County that, we, that make us who we are. We have everything on the left side from the natural areas and the rural communities. And as you work your way up, you see different types of development patterns in different types of communities, ranging from the suburban in the middle and all the way over to the more intense and um, um, urban areas to the right. Orange Code implements that vision in Orange, in, um, by um, uh, addressing standards and performance standards that result in that type of development to the top and protecting the areas that we want to protect. The T1, T2, all the way to the T6, this is our um, consolidated name of new zoning districts that we're approaching with Vision, uh, Vision 2015 Orange Code. Um, right now we have like almost 35 different conventional zoning districts. And in addition to that, we have a PD zoning district. So we're consolidating those down to these simple six transect zones. And there are um, sub-districts uh, underneath each one of the T1 and T2. There's a T1.1, T1.2, and it goes all the way across the board. But we're going from like 35 conventional zoning districts down to 18. Um, so it's a lot more easy to navigate if you ever, ever have to open up a land development code and find what a property can do and can't do. Why are we doing this? Well, we're growing a lot, obviously. You live here, you've, you've experienced the growth. Right now, in 2023, we're sitting at 1.5 million people in all of Orange County, and that includes the cities. By the time we get to 2050, we're gonna be at 2 million. That's a 35% population increase from where we are and an additional 478,000 people. That's almost a half million people more who are coming to Orange County, and that's just our medium projection. Some would argue that it's going to be greater. Some are going to, that are, would argue it's a little less. We're going with the safe road in the middle, and that, that, that takes us to 2, point, um, 2 million, basically, by the year 2050. This is how our comp plan today is structured. Um, the, yellow, the yellow dots in the, around the, um, the big circle represent the required elements in our comprehensive plan that the state requires us to have. The other um, dots represent um, optional elements that we've included. Again, 19 chapters. The document is about four inches deep, um, what, um, you know, heavy. And so we're changing that to Vision 2050. We're consolidating those 19 elements into 10 chapters. All of the major topics are still addressed, but we've consolidated some of those into some easier navigable um, chapters. How the... the, um, the all this is imp implemented is our new development framework. And I'll, I'll try to dump it down for you. Basically, Vision 2050 starts the big picture, which we call market areas. We drill down to sectors, which I'll explain in a second. And then we get down to place types, which is our new future land use map. This is the map of the proposed market areas within Orange County. They're, they're different than the BCC or the board districts that you're, you may be accustomed to. Um, most of Hunters Creek, and you'll see that in the little yellow box, um, is it's actually split between the southwest and south market area right there that area is represents hunters creek and so it's a little bit in both but what you'll find in the comprehensive plan or in the vision 2050 document are we have policies that address the unique character of each one of these six areas of the county our, our comp plan today doesn't do that it's a one size fits all and we've learned that one community is very different from another in fact if you look at northwest county and you go up to like mount door and tangerine you compare that to what's happening in the South Market area near the airport, completely different. So we've, we've addressed that with unique policies that address each one of these individual market areas. This is that second layer, the, the sector map, and I'll get into this in a little bit more detail, detail so I won't spend too much time on it. But basically, this is the overall county, and each one of those colors represents how we want growth to occur in the future. The red areas on the map represent that targeted area where we want growth to happen because it has the infrastructure and the services ready to accommodate new development. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the greens. Those are the rural areas and the, the, the highly environmentally sensitive areas that we want to protect. And in the middle, you have the yellows, which is the established area, like Hunters Creek, where you have existing planned communities that um, we already know the plan for that, and it's basically to maintain the, the beauty and the aesthetics of the, of the community. We're not trying to in, in, in introduce anything that's going to change that. So that's our established sector. Um, not as much growth is anticipated to, to be accommodated there as it is in the targeted sector. Um, our plan focuses on different elements, but 
in that targeted sector where we want growth to occur over the next 27 years, that's where we, we think growth can transform, evolve, and growth can be accommodated to serve most of the new population. Areas like Hunters Creek, which fall in the established area, we want to maintain that. We don't want it to get worse, but we also recognize that it's not going to be the, 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 the most targeted area for new, de new development. Our comp plan focuses on three types of general types of development, centers, corridors, and neighborhoods. I won't go through them all, but there you'll find centers, corridors, and neighborhoods in all parts of the county. Just one example, the regional center is one type of center. It's in a very urban environment like I drive, maybe around UCF. But then we have rural centers that are also scaled to meet the needs in the context of a rural community like a rural settlement. They're both centers, and we have policies that address both. And you'll see different types of corridors in different types of neighborhoods, regardless of where you are in the county. Getting back to that targeted growth sector, again, these are areas with, with existing or planned access to transit, services, and jobs. Um, it includes centers and corridors, and that's where we, we want most of the new and intense development to occur. Again, it's the red areas on this map. Um, right now, it's 37,000 acres. Um, it's about 19% of what we call our urban service area, the, the overall area of development in Orange County that we want to um, occur, the land area we want that growth to occur. Um, right now, the population in that red area is 176,000 people, a little over. Um, the average density, the number of units per acre, is actually pretty low, though. It's 2.8 units per acre. That's really low for an area you want to, development to occur in. And what that tells us is that Development's not happening where it should. It's going out into the, to, into the hinterlands where we, the services aren't there. So that's one of the reasons we're changing this plan. Um, get it, um, this is the, what we want to happen over the next 20, 27 years. We want that density to be increased at about, about 15 acres, I mean 15 units per acre. It's a big increase. But again, that's where we want the development to occur. Um, that's going to result in 194,000 additional people. And of the growth that we anticipate between now and 20, um, 2027, this area in the red will accommodate 41% of that population growth. <clears throat> now we get to the established area, which most of Hunter Creek, Hunter's Creek falls in. Again, this is, um, applies to previously developed single-family neighborhoods, including master plan communities or some. Um, growth or infill would be would would not be would not be will not be significant because we want to maintain what's there. These are the areas in the yellow, and again, Hunter's Creek is on this next slide. There you go. Um, we want the ad, we want the average density in the um, targeted sector to be about 6.5 units per acre. Um, again, 31,000 more people living in the established area. That's everything in the yellow area. Um, that's not much, though. That's only 6.4% of new growth between now and 20, um, 2027. Excuse me, 2050. Um, and then finally, I'm, we don't have any net, um, really any existing rural communities in Hunters Creek or in, in, the, in the near vicinity, but I want to show you how important it is. The rural sector, again, is to minimize, country, uh, it, to minimize countryside development pressure to enable viable agriculture and open lands. It's the areas on the green on this map, and as you, if you ever get out, you know, in the east part of the county or northwest, and even parts of, of southwest Orange County, you'll see these rural communities. And the comp plan in Vision 2050 really strives to protect that character, even in, in a more important way than we do now, or more successful way. Only a very limited amount, even though it's 138,000 acres, only a little bit of, de of development is anticipated, 18,000 acres o over the next 27 years. Um, the densities that will, will remain very low, and that it's only accommodating 2.3% of our new growth in Orange County between now and 2050. This is the, the, the third and final layer of, that, of the, the three tiers we talked about. This is the place type map. If any of you are uh, familiar with our future land use map today, this is the future land use map. Um, we are changing the nomenclature of the future land use map designations to place types because that's what they are, they, they create places. Um, you can see that little box on the bottom there, that's the area of Hunter's Creek, and I'm gonna zoom into that real quick. 
now you see the Hunters Creek area and the various land use designations that um, are shown on the detailed land use plan. If you were to compare this to the map we have today for Hunters Creek, it's not that different. Um, the names of the districts are different or the, the land use designations are different, but basically everything in the yellow are, continues to represent the single family neighborhoods. Um, the red areas are either existing or planned commercial development activity or a mix of uses. Um, then there's some other uses in, in there, such as the schools and institutional uses. If you go to our comprehensive plan and look at our comp plan document, it's very engaging. Unlike our plan today, which is a lot of text and nothing else, there's a lot of pictures, a lot of graphics. Um, it's far more engaging than our plan today. And you can find a cut sheet, which basically gives you photos and images of what we anticipate in each of the land use designations. Also, the, the, the densities and other information that if you want to just take a site and you find out what its land use is, you can go to the comp plan, the Vision 2050 comp plan, and actually see and actually rip out a piece of, 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 the, of the page and show your neighbor, this is what this area is planned for. Um, so these cut sheets are very helpful, and there's one for every um, of our every one of our place type districts or place type um, land uses in the county. Again, this this is all the urban one. Now you're getting into the more suburban feel. And then of course we have the suburban neighborhood, which is again most of what Hunters Creek is today. So now just and I'll wrap up with Orange Code. Orange Code is the document that implements that vision. And <laughs> We are, um, there's, a, there's a slight delay, with the, with not delay, but it's, it's tracking a little bit behind the comp plan. The comp plan has to go through a process where we send it to the state for review, and then it comes back. And when it comes back, and I'll show the timeline of that process for you shortly, um, it merges with Orange Code, and the board will eventually adopt Vision 2050 and Orange Code together. Um, they, you can't do one without the other. Um, they're, 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 it's, it's crucial that they both get adopted at the same time. And, and again, right now it's scheduled for um, transmittal for the comp plan next month, July 25th. And then hopefully by the end of this year, or maybe even early next year, we get to the point where we go to the board and we ask them to consider adoption. Um, that's the, this is the transect. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. This is just transect, though. Again, the same, the same concept where you have the images that reflect the development pattern you can see in each of the transect zones, right, ranging from T1 to T6. In terms of public engagement and input, we have a, a, a website dedicated to Orange Code and Vision 2050. Um, that web page is listed on the top of the screen. There's been a lot of changes to it over the last few months. We now have our draft map, and you can go to this and click on a, a certain portion of this page, and it will take you to an interactive mapping page this is that interface. If you go to this page, all you have to do is type in any address. It doesn't have to be your address. It could be your, your cousin's who lives out in Christmas. You can type in their address, and this will take you directly to that area and show you what their land use is projected to be. And you can click on it again, and I'll just go through these little steps here. It'll take you a little closer to the property, and eventually you'll get to the point where you can provide public comments about it, there's also those cut sheets will pop up and tell you more about the land use designation. Um, it's, very, it's very interactive. We've gotten a lot of comments about it, um, and we're answering every comment that somebody submits on the plan. We make sure they get a response on their questions. Um, then lastly, we, we are conducting a series of town hall meetings. The board asked us in April um, when we had our first public hearing. Um, when they, they delayed it slightly to, to July 25th for the sole purpose of having some additional community outreach. We've conducted, <laughs> as of today, eight of those town hall meetings across the county. These have already been completed, and this is what's left. And so we have nine more to go before um, we get to our next public hearing on July 25th. If you want to know more about what I'm talking about, and you will a slightly longer presentation, <laughs> um, it's a the very interactive town hall meeting. We have stations set up get, uh, around the room where people can go talk to different staff people about different things. Um, the map, they can talk about the interactive mapping interface, a lot of different things. And we have like 18 staff members there to help you one-on-one. And so far, the reaction has been very, has over, been overwhelmingly supportive. And we hope that you would, would if you have the time to jump on one of the, in, any of these meetings, even though these are all kind of specific to a community, we have that one station where we can pull up any side of the county. So you can go to our county calendar, find out exactly where these are, um, get the address, and, and feel free to join us. 
Um, and then lastly, our, our next public hearing is scheduled for July 25th, and we're really, really hoping that we get a vote for transmittal so we can focus on the code and get everything back ready for adoption later this fall. And this is just the timeline moving forward, which shows our tentative schedule for adoption in December. And that completes my part. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, I, and once we're totally done, we'll open it up for questions because I know this one, there's a lot of questions. I, I will say as a, um, a big policy like geek, I have been so grateful for the amount of engagement that we've been able to get in the experts that have been working on this for so long. And when they opened up that, that platform where you could actually you know, go in and look at the map and ask the questions, I was really worried people weren't going to take advantage of that. So I'm hoping that people are, if you have questions, if you have comments, please take advantage of that because they're, you know, it's a very, um, a very specific decision that we've made to try to get as much input as we can before we transmit it to the state. Cause we know that it's a long time. This plan will operate as sort of our, you know, the governing, the, the roadmap. And so the, we have to get it right this time. Um, I will not hold up the sheriff anymore here. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Chris Barrett. I was the captain of the sector until last Sunday, and then I got transferred. But I do have your new captain here, Captain Daryl Blanford's over here around the corner. He'll uh, be happy to stay afterwards and introduce himself to you. Um, I would say this, if, feel free to send him all your complaints now. <laughs> okay, so... I was going to say, I think he walked into one right when we got here. Right? He is. So. <laughs> uh, he's going to be the new captain of Sector 4. I'm not leaving Hunter's Creek. I will still coordinate the off-duty down here in Hunter's Creek. So I still will have my hand in down here in Hunter's Creek, and we'll be working together to help solve some of the issues that uh, we have. Um, moving forward, just want to kind of cover a couple, couple things here. Here's a, just a, a, a graph on crime, property crime, violent crime in Hunter's Creek as it compares to the county. Um, in the county in general being the yellow line and the Hunters Creek being the orange line. You can see how it's gone down over the years uh, very drastically, which, which is very nice. Um, but it sets you up for failure sometimes because as soon as you start having an increase, the numbers look even bigger because your numbers are so low. <coughs> so just think about that. Um, you can see over the, the, the uh, five years here, uh, down 67 percent since uh, 2018, which is pretty impressive. Uh, I will tell you that in sector four, that's the lowest in this entire sector. Um, there's nothing that low out here. Uh, street racing concerns, obviously this is an ongoing issue. Um, it's not only occurring locally, it's occurring nationwide. Uh, we continue to fight it. Uh, we run operations. Uh, we have an operation that started in April called Operation No Donuts. Um, so those uh, stats there are about two weeks old. Um, you can see the arrests that have been made, the citations that have been issued. Um, the good thing here is that, so there is a statute in the street racing statute that allows us to seize vehicles for 30 days, uh, which is very good for those vehicles that we catch. Um, the ones that run from us, we have implemented where we're using the helicopter a lot more and we will follow them. If we can get their car and it belongs to them, we're gonna forfeit their car, uh, which hurts them not only with the car, but depending on how much they owe, that type of thing, they're gonna, the uh, company's gonna go back after them. Will you play the video, please? I've been informed we won't have the audio that goes with it, so if you want to add your own. Oh, sound really? Effects, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to add any sound effects, but you can get the gist of it. That's what we're dealing with now. That happens in the intersections. There we go. How many of the cars that you catch out there are stolen cars, or are they? No, nope, they're cars. Owner? Most or of them are their cars. Okay. Out. Mm -hmm. That white one there, um, that was the first night that we ran the operation. Uh, that vehicle took off from us, I think Taft Byland, I believe is where, where was it? Lee Vista. Lee Vista. Um, but uh, we followed him all the way to the Hard Rock in Tampa. Um, yeah. 
and he tried to get up into the to the hard rock to hide and jumped out of his car in a parking lot. Um, luckily, they have very good video, so <laughs> we're working on uh, handling that one. Um, but it's it, it's an ongoing issue. We continue to, to, to deal with it on a weekly basis. We run an operation weekly out here, uh, especially in Sector 4 and Sector 2 are the main areas. Um, along with enforcement, we do a lot of community <coughs> engagement. Um, these are two programs that we're working on right now. The Teen Academy is going on right now, and it basically brings teens in, and we get to show them our environment. And they get to ask questions and see everything that we do as law enforcement, not only on the law enforcement side, but some of the investigative side with forensics and things of that nature. Um, and then the, dra the uh, Dueling Dragons is another, um, it actually is like a boat race um, that everybody paddles. And law enforcement is paired up with youth and they practice and, pr and then they actually compete and they win prizes. So it's, it's a very good uh, program. Uh, crime Prevention Awards. So you, the last three years, we've given over $385,000 back to the community. That is from seized drug money is where that comes from. So uh, we find the 5013Cs um, that are doing good work, and we put it out to them to apply for the grants, and we, we issue out grants up to $10,000 uh, per entity for them. Before I go... I want to do want to cover some stuff because there's st stuff has come up uh john young parkway you know traffic is a, is a huge issue for the sheriff's office um we recently does anybody remember seeing uh the digital signs the digital, digital speed limit signs in the last couple of weeks on john young parkway anybody see them yeah so remember last year we put up some devices that were collecting information so we could find out how many cars were running down um, Town Center Boulevard in between John Young and the trail. Well, they were doing the same thing, collecting information. Um, if you don't remember, last year when we did the study on Town Center Boulevard, about 7,000 cars a day, one way, on, on Town Center Boulevard. Um, John Young Parkway averages uh, northbound, averages uh, 8,800 cars a day. Southbound averages over 10,000 cars a day. So understanding traffic, I will tell you, just to kind of, so I give you some mentality of where we're at. Um, in sector four, there's 170, it's supposed to be 177 positions in the sector. We're down, but even at 177 positions, divide those in half. Okay, so what's that giving you? About 85 people working a day? Think now add that compared to the traffic volume. It's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle, but we continue to fight it. We continue to do everything we can to do that. Um, we and that's why we have the Operation No Donuts going. Um, the captain, we set up a program in Sector Four that anytime we get complaint areas, we make sure we're going out there, writing a, at least a couple tickets because those tickets add up, and hopefully we can make some changes in some people's behaviors. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. I was gonna say, I'm, I mean, as you know, as a partner, coming here and actually meeting individually with some of our residents and being responsive you know, about things big and small, I would say that um, it has to be a, a partnership for us, sheriff and resident because i know that sometimes it's the eyes on it's the pace car it's making sure that we're doing the educational piece of it and that it you know obviously we can get better and better but i i am really grateful for the partnership i know you all got the update about some of those speed limits coming down i know that that doesn't necessarily mean people will follow those speed limits coming down but it gives us more tools to work with and that's something that um we wouldn't have been able to get done without the um partnership so thank you so much i do want to open it up to questions i want to thank everybody here um who's been able to to share information if we have some time is it okay if i open it up for questions yeah i just want to remind you everybody Great, thank you so much. If there's any questions, if you'll come on up to the mic, we can. Yes, thank you so much. Oh, that mic, never mind. I'm pointing, you know. 
I'll have you running all over the place. Sorry. Hi. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Overberger. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's uh, wonderful to see you all. Um, I'm the chairperson of the Chalfont neighborhood, which is the first neighborhood <coughs> on North Town Loop Boulevard. And as you come off southbound John Young Parkway. And the thing I wanted to talk about, and this will fall right into your lap, uh, Mr. Costello, is that back on December 13th of last year, I reported to the board and the staff, and they knew about this too, someone from Orange County changed the 35 mile an hour speed limit sign to 30. Yes, sir. So they inquired, and of course, nobody seemed to know what happened. However, they did a traffic study, of course. This all culminated in an action request from March 31st this year that for approval to decrease the speed limit on the entire length of Town Loop Boulevard <laughs> from 35 to 30 miles an hour. Correct. Well, they never changed the signs. So I called 311. I knew you folks are awesome. And I explained to the young lady on the phone this situation. And I said, when are they going to come over? Because I have a copy of, from your website, uh, Commissioner, yeah. when they passed the resolution. When are they going to change the signs to 30? Because one, it's very confusing to everybody. Right. Number two, we want Captain Barrett and our off duties to start doing some radar so they really know what the speed limit is. And hopefully, if we ever get our electronic speed sign on North Town Loop Boulevard, we know what the speed limit is. So... If you can look into that and hopefully get that done within a reasonable amount of time, I think everyone that travels Town Loop Boulevard, not only from Town Hall all the way around to John Young, will be appreciative. So, but thank you for your time. Cap, we're going to miss you. But I still got your email address. <laughs> thank you. We got, yeah. Yes. Yes, so, so I'm going to be looking into that tomorrow, and, and just to make sure if I can get your, yeah, okay. Yes, so, uh, yes, please, so if you can give me that information and also your phone number, so I will look into that tomorrow and then contact you. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. First, thank you all so much for coming out here. Greatly appreciate it. My name's Jocelyn. I live in Casa Vista. That's west of Shingle Creek. Um, it's hurricane season, obviously. I'm a big believer in being prepared. Um, when Hurricane Ian came, it rose Shingle Creek higher and crested faster than any hurricane I've seen in about 20 years. Uh, we have an evacuation route to the north. It happens to go through a FEMA floodplain. FEMA got it right. It flooded. We have an evacuation route to the south. Also happens to go through a FEMA floodplain. Um, in the spirit of advanced preparation, hopefully you never need this, but just wanted to ask, if a hurricane ever raised Shingle Creek to the point where Town Center Boulevard was closed, is there a route that emergency services could use to access households west of Shingle Creek and those residents could use to leave? That's a great question, and I need to, I'm so glad. She's right here. So, um, so I could speak to that from a fire rescue perspective. Yes, we maintain um, an ability to respond to those types of things. In fact, if you're watching the news during Ian, um, we made several thousand rescues overnight during that storm. So um, our, our strategy is, is, is kind of multi-pronged. We have what we call high water vehicles. Um, if you remember the brush fire truck I showed you, the sister truck to that is called a woods truck. It is this ginormous uh, truck that, that uh, the wheelbase has it about uh, six feet off the road and it can go through high water. Uh, it is capable of towing our boats, so we have a number of rescue boats um, available to us. And then we have um, a, a group of technicians that are called Swift Water Rescue Technicians, and they are specifically trained in, in flood, flood water rescue. So obviously, um, the best strategy is that we provide enough information so you can evacuate if there's a concern. But should you find yourself in a, in a situation where you can't get the car out and, and there's no other way out, we got you back. We'll take care of you. Yeah, and, you know, from a policy perspective, it has been obviously top of mind for everybody in, in low-lying places, places that are closer to floodplains and that would need to 
transverse floodplains. I know the, you know, the budget season this year was so different because of the conversations about things that we may need that we really hadn't contemplated um, before in these type of emergency situations. So. It, I think I can speak for my board that we're all really aware and we don't want to we don't want to be in a position where we don't have a plan and have everything lined up to go come Saturday to our Hurricane Expo <laughs> shameless plug um, because I do think there's going to be some pretty good information there also just about that the network of communication that happens when there is an emergency to make sure we are alerting people in a timely fashion of what to do next. That it? All right, awesome. Quick, a couple, just a couple more quick housekeeping things that I, you know, I had the. Um it's awesome to have this type of team here because they were able to um, plug some of the things that I, I wanted to make sure we were plugging. The Vision 2050 meetings are ongoing. Um, so I would say if you're interested in going to any of them, if it doesn't have necessarily have to be a district one because the experts that are there from the planning staff will be able to still address the questions. Um, so I encourage you to go to that. The other ones I wanted to remind you of, Right now, our Charter Review Commission is meeting. Uh, Orange County is a charter county. It's one of 20 charter counties in the state of Florida. And our charter is sort of, um, uh, it's our mini constitution. And only every four years do we get the opportunity to ask citizens to come in. They sit on a panel of, of appointees and uh, discuss potential options for how to change our charter or what our charter should look like. They are meeting right now, um, I think it's monthly, and that will be going on throughout the next year. Um, so I believe they had one tonight. The next one is going to be, I think, a month from now. Please make sure you're getting my newsletter for the location. There'll be The one in District 1 will be in October. So that's going to be the final in the, in the series of, of um, the ones that are happening in the district. And then we have on the um, just upcoming calendar items, there's a job fair for our Orange County Head Start on the 23rd. If we have any teachers in our lives or teacher assistants that are looking for opportunities we are hiring and actually that's probably true for so many of our wonderful departments um, and then we're also right now in the midst of an um, awareness campaign on elder abuse and there's some educational opportunities coming up there I believe there's um, a workshop tomorrow and there's more information about that um, if you will uh, check out our social media page and we I think posted it yesterday on the date and details um, is there anything I'm missing I'm looking over at my staff to make sure that there's no dates coming up all right and thank you so so much for allowing us this time and spending the evening with us we are really grateful to have you here and um, we'll see you next time I want to say, make sure that we said thank you to all of you spending all your time coming out and giving us all this great information. I don't know about anybody else, but I learned a great deal. So thank you very much, and we appreciate it. And thank you.